which is limula blah, blah. limulus amoebus arthropod. Arthropods take segmentation to a whole new level by actually fusing certain segments. This is what we call tagmatization. The main advantage of metamerism is that you are now able to localize body movements as well as certain body functions. With tagmatization, now you have division of labor. That means that not all segments have to have the same organs. You can now even localize which organs go where. Looking at the typical arthropod body plan, main segments would be the head, thorax, and the abdomen. This will definitely vary across the different arthropod groups. I think from the get-go, we know that it's an arthropod because it's crunchy on the outside, and that's thanks to the rigid exoskeleton. Comparing it to the previous phyla that we've discussed, those phyla relied on what we call the hydrostatic skeleton to be able to move. By controlling and distributing the fluid pressure throughout their bodies, they can somehow change how their body looks like because they're squishy. But if you have a rigid container such as this, no matter how much you try to slosh the fluid, this really, the outer part, doesn't change. That's the main disadvantage of having an exoskeleton. So how exactly are they going to move? Arthropods give skin and bones a totally different meaning in that their skin not just serves as their skin, but it also actually serves as the framework by which they move. Like any suit of armor, somebody has to be inside to control the armor. You, the person inside controlling the armor, you would be like the muscles and the armor would be the exoskeleton. The rigid exoskeleton, however, has limitations in terms of growth. Pag meron suit of armor, tapos tumabaka. You have to get a different suit of armor to suit your bigger size. That's why for arthropods, they have the mechanism called molting or ecdysis. Ecdysis literally means escape. They kind of have to get out of their old exoskeleton and then put on a new one. How exactly do they grow the new thing? Do they just slap on new hard stuff? For us to really understand that, we first have to look at the anatomy of the exoskeleton. The exoskeleton has a cuticular layer. You can break it down into several more layers. The outermost epicuticle, typically waxy and lipid-based. In, in, in many ways, that's like the waterproofing layer. And then underneath that, you have the procuticle. The procuticle is mostly made of chitin and also a bit of fats, but it's also impregnated with proteins. This structure, at the beginning of the molt, it kind of starts out as soft and pliable. What happens is the proteins in the procuticle, they start forming cross linkages. That whole process is sclerotization. And that's when the cuticle starts to harden, giving the arthropod its hard, tough armor. And if they want to make that even harder and tougher, they sometimes impregnate the procuticle with calcium carbonate as well. Have you ever seen an arthropod sit down? Dinga, kasi la silang silia. That's not something that you're gonna see from the get-go, but that's also one of the defining features of arthropods. Surprisingly, they do not have cilia. Yeah, nga, no cilia. You know picture of cilia. No cilia. Ito naman, no? Arthro means joint, poda, foot. Joint, foot. These are the animals with jointed appendages. It will be no surprise, therefore, that much of their classification and taxonomy has a lot to do with their feet, the kind of feet that they have, the way that their feet look like, how many feet they have, and so on and so forth. This is what arthropods are all about. Their fucking feet. Hindi po matigas yung exoskeleton, so how can they have joints that are flexible? Wala masyadong cross linkages na nangyayari dun sa joints so that it still remains fairly flexible but still be covered with the cuticle. Talking about a phylum that literally translates to joint foot warrants a closer inspection on the structures that actually unite them all. In a broad sense, arthropod appendages could either be classified as uniramus or biramus. This was in fact a way to classify the arthropods. Uni, one, ramus, branch. One branch, and the segments are connected end to end. Bi, two, ramus, branch. There are two branches that come out of the basal segment. 
The names of the leg segments don't really vary that much across the different groups. There's always going to be the coxae, the trochanther, the femur, the tibia, the tarsus. These are some of the basic structures of your typical arthropod legs. Just expect that for biramous appendages, each segment of that appendage will have more names and different names. Aside from the legs that these arthropods use to move around, there are other structures that are jutting out of their bodies that are designed maybe for eating, mating, sensing the environment. Collectively, these are all called appendages, along with the legs, because they are attached to or appended to the body. Appendages can be present or absent in each of the body segments depending on the arthropod group that we'll be discussing. But just something to keep in mind is that if we call it an appendage, it's not just the legs. It's a lot of the other stuff that's stuck to the body as well. Arthropods can be broadly classified into three groups. Actually, I think there are a lot more, but we're just going to stick with these three. The trilobites, the chelicerates, and the mandibulae. For this video, we're only going to be discussing the trilobites and the chelicerates. For the mandibulates, that's like a whole long story. So we're going to devote several other videos for the members of Mandibular. Trilobites are ancient arthropods that go all the way to the Cambrian period. So how do you know that it's a trilobite? It's dead. <laughs> the standard body plan of a trilobite is you have the cephalon, the thorax, and then the pygidium. But what really makes a trilobite a trilobite, there are two longitudinal furrows that run from the head all the way to the pygidium that divide the animal into three lobes. Their body plan, as simple as it may be, has been such a successful body plan that it survived two of the five mass extinction events. Chelicerate does not have antennae. Typical body plan is the prosoma and the opisthosoma. Their head and their thorax are fused into what we call the prosoma or also known as the cephalothorax. Six pairs of appendages or 12 appendages total. First pair is the chelicerae. Second pair would be the pedipalps. The remaining four pairs would be the walking legs. Class Merostomata is represented by just one extant group, which is order Ziphosura. Ziphos is sword, Ura is tail. That's because the last portion of their body is drawn out into this elongated spike called a telson. If they ever flip over, there's really no way for them to flip back. That's what the telson is mainly for. It's just to flip them back over right side up. How can you tell a male from a female horseshoe crab? You can look at the second pair of appendages or the pedipalps. For males, kilala nyo ba si Popeye? Tan 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 tan. It's like he has these that that big thing. Yung lalaki ganon. Just for females, wala. Ganon la. Apart from that, females are bigger. When horseshoe crabs mate, usually they kind of synchronize this with the full moon. Many corals and sponges also kind of spawn during the full moon. It's not really certain at this point, but it might have something to do with the tides. But full moon or new moon, the tides are really high. So I mean, if you like cast all your eggs into the sea, that just gives them more chance to float around and stuff. So maybe that's one reason. If you all lay your eggs and spawn and release your sperm and eggs, all at the same time, in terms of predation, there's an increased chance of survival. Kung lahat kayo sabi sabi kayo mga itlog, predators can only eat so many eggs. If you like go boom, one time, big time, hindi yung predators para oh my. Ganun yung mga strategies when you have synchronous mating or synchronous spawning. They have this really sensitive immune system that allows them to detect toxins produced by bacteria. Humans exploit that by harvesting their blood and producing the substance called LAL, which stands for Limulus Amoebocyte Lysate. LAL is used in the medical and pharmaceutical industry to test for bacterial contamination in the many medical and pharmaceutical products. If you have ever had an injection or if you've ever taken any medicine, then you have the horseshoe crab to thank. Thank you, horseshoe crab. Glass arachnida, the household poster children of chelicerae. There are actually a lot more, but these are the only ones we'll be discussing. Opiliones. Opilio actually means shepherd. They're also commonly called daddy long legs or harvest men. Back in the olden days, shepherds in Europe, they used to walk on stilts. Siguro para matanaw nila lahat ng mga tupa na inaalagaan nila. And that's how they got the name because the members of this group have really long legs that make them look like they're walking on stilts. 
And I think pag sinabi nating arachnid, the very first thing we think about are spiders. Spiders are just one type of arachnid under the order Araniae. If you actually look at their body, their opisthosoma actually has these structures or the appendages called spinnerets. The cephalothorax is distinctly separate from the abdomen, sometimes by a pedestal. Kitang kita mo na hiwalay yung cephalothorax dun sa abdomen. There are members of spiders under the family Folsidae, which we call the daddy long leg spiders. And they look like daddy long legs, as in the daddy long legs opilionis. So you would know if it's a spider because it spins webs. Pag may sapot, automatic, you know that it's a daddy long leg spider. Apart from that, have a close look at the body. For opilionis, they do not have that distinct waist. Walang bewang. Diretso lang. Cephalothorax abdomen is just one thing. For true spiders, they have the cephalothorax and then this teeny tiny constriction and then the abdomen. Scorpions, pretty easy to distinguish. It has those big pincers and then that venomous stinger at the end. The pincers are actually the second pair of appendages, so those would be technically the pedipulps. That means that the pedipulps can look vastly different across the different groups of cholesterates. Their opisthosoma is divided into two segments, the mesosoma and the metasoma. The metasoma is the one that kind of curls upward and then at the end it has that venomous stinger. Amblypygi are commonly known as your whip spiders or your tailless whip scorpions. This is very confusing, we're gonna discuss this a little bit later. Ambly, blunt. Pygy, which is the rump or the butt, blunt, puet. The first pair would be the cholicery. The pedipulps are raptorial, so that helps them get food. But the first pair of walking legs for them look like whips. They do not have antennae. Instead, they have antenniform legs. They kind of have these legs that do that job. That's why you can call them whip spiders. They're not really spiders, but they have whips and they look like spiders, whip spiders. Amblypygi could be mistaken for a different order of arachnids called vinegaroons or the whip scorpions. Why whip scorpions are They look like scorpions, except that the tail part looks like a whip, kaya whip scorpion. Yung pedipalps nila, parang yung pedipalps ng scorpion, malaki. The first pair of walking legs look like whips as well, or antenniform legs, kung tawagin. So kaya si Amblypygi, magkamukha sila ng whip scorpion. How would you be able to tell Amblypygi from the actual whip scorpion. Tignan nyo yung puwet. Kung wala nung parang buntot dun sa dulo, then you know that it's an Amblypygi. That's why another common name for Amblypygi would be the tailless whip scorpion. Nakakalito no, either whip spider siya or tailless whip scorpion. If you don't want to be confused, just call it Amblypygi and let's call it a day. Acari or the ticks and mites. Dito nakakasama yung mga garapatan ng inyong mga asot pusa. Nagsisimula yan, napakaliit. But then once it engorges itself with your blood, it inflates into that thing. That thing that you see see is mostly the opisthosoma. That's one of the main distinguishing features of acari is that the prosoma and the opisthosoma, they're almost fused to the point that you can no longer recognize the prosoma. Nakikita nyo na lang halos is opisthosoma. These are some of the most common ectoparasites in a lot of animals. And apart from being ectoparasites that just suck the blood out of you, they are also vectors of disease. If you see one, take it off of your dogs because they could get sick from whatever disease that these ticks could get. So to help you remember all of these arachnids, if it's opilionis, you know that they have long legs. They kind of look like spiders, but they do not have that constriction between the cephalothorax and the abdomen. Zero waist puet. Amblypygi, from the name Amblypygi blunt rump, so blunt puet. Araniae would be your spiders. They have spinnerets at the abdomen, that spin web, spinning puet. Scorpions, at the end, they have that venomous stinger, stinging puet. Acari, which are the mites and ticks where you cannot distinguish cephalothorax from the abdomen and so it is nothing but puet. Puete na ba? Puete na! This was the opening photograph when I introduced arthropods. Bakit bulaklak, ma'am? Yeah, let's wait for it. You see it? You see it now? There it is! Foot for thought. What do you think is the advantage of having jointed appendages? Ano ba nangyari sa hayop? Particularly the worm group. And then compare that now to the arthropod group. 
Ano ba yung advantage na nagkaroon na ng legs? Armed with the information that you learn now, let's see if you can answer these. Are all arachnids spiders? Are spiders scorpions and mites and ticks? Insects? Are whip spiders spiders? Are whip scorpions scorpions? Are whip spiders whip scorpions? Test yourself, see if you can answer the questions, and I think at of this point you know that the answer to all of these questions is NO! Today we talked about what makes an arthropod an arthropod, and we also discussed the first few groups of arthropods, the trilobites, the extinct group, and the chalicerates, the ones with the chalicerae, no antennae, and six pairs of appendages. If you want to know more, check out these videos. I left a few for you. I'll see you guys next time.